Hi, everyone. One of the things I really admire about this organization and this conference is that the team has been so committed to getting us to make personal connections with each other. And I think one way to do that is through our work, but I think another is by just finding things that we connect about. So before I dive into the product stuff, I grew up in Michigan. I've lived at this point in Seattle, New York, San Francisco, and Boston, and really like to compare the tech ecosystems. I love to travel. I like to scuba dive. I like going to fancy dinner. I like keeping very meticulous records of what types of cheese I've tried and why. And recently, I started rock climbing because I was very afraid of heights, and I thought it would be a good thing to try and to learn. All that to say, maybe that's something we can connect over during lunch or in a break later today. But for right now, I want to talk about balancing vision and management for team success, or as my friends have suggested I name this talk, this is fine, all of the mistakes I have ever made. <laughs> and so to give you an idea, it lists everything in the program as I work for a secret stealthy startup. It turns out we're not stealthy so much as we've been really heads down focused on building product instead of announcing names or what we're doing or doing PR or talking about any of that. Uh, but the company is named Dark, and we're working on making it 100 times easier to build software by greatly reducing the complexity that goes into setting up backend infrastructure for the things that you're building. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that, especially if you have expertise in infrastructure, because everything I did before the startup was consumer. Before this, like Dan said, I was head of product at Lola Travel, which is what I'm going to talk about a lot today, and a product manager at Kickstarter and Microsoft. And so to call this out in advance, most of my expertise comes from the very early stage of things, and you'll kind of see that throughout this talk, although I think some of the concepts will play through even when you're at a greater scale. And so to talk about Lola. When I joined Lola, it wasn't Lola at all. We were a consumer tech incubator, and we were called Blade. And we, for some reason, designed our office to also double as a nightclub. <laughs> and so it was a bit of a strange place. So the idea was we'd make some investments, we'd do some cool projects, we'd have a bunch of cool people around all the time. And I agreed to join as a summer CEO intern. And I'm pretty sure there's nothing more oxymoronic than CEO intern. But it turns out that it's a lot like being an entrepreneur in residence. And this was a super cool job. It was just me. And I got to do really fun things. At the beginning, I just started out researching everyone who's working in the personal assistant space, which was something I was interested in. I met Ilya here earlier today, who works at x.ai. I spent a ton of time looking at scheduling startups, at Zirtual, at things like that. I got to hire lots of personal assistants, which is really fun when you're an intern. I got to have dinner with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and talk about how we might partner. It's a cool thing about being in a high-profile incubator. I got to write code. I got to be a travel agent and go to travel agent school when we decided to focus on travel. Everything was great. Two months later, we stopped being an incubator, decided to be Lola, and our core technical staff moved over. This was also pretty great. We had an offsite to kick off the plan. We all learned how to fly drones together. We started building monthly roadmaps, sending monthly update emails, until about six months in. When all of a sudden, I looked around, and there were 50 people, and we had scaled 50x in six months, and everything had completely broken. And pretty much every day, I was doing something I had no idea how to do. It started with just managing people, and then I realized I was in 30 plus meetings a week, most of which were one-on-ones, and that didn't feel sustainable. And then I was hiring people, and where when I wanted to do vision work or anything interesting, it only happened on weekends and only on Sunday mornings. And if I didn't do it, it was, it was never going to happen. And every time I felt like I was getting closer and I would get to do something else, something else crazy would happen where suddenly I would also be running this all hands for 50 people. Or then one of our co-founders left and we rearranged the executive team. And then we decided to pivot and focus on primarily business travelers. And so it started to feel like this, to the point where I purchased the stuffed animal to put on my desk to remind myself not to take it too seriously. Well, at the end of this two and a half year journey, going from just me hanging out writing code to Series B funded company of 50 people, I thought, I'm really tired. And if I'm going to do this again for another startup, I've got to figure out a better way to do it next time. And so I came to the conclusion, 50-50. 50% of time vision, 50% of time management, just fine. I hope you know that I'm obviously kidding, because you would not be spending your Sunday morning trying to think about the vision if there had been a better way. And if I'd gone to work on a Thursday and said, hold on, I know I'm blocking you, and I know this is a problem, but I really need to sit in this conference room alone and think, it just wouldn't have been fair to the team or anyone. And so I thought about it, and I thought, OK, I'm going to go back to the beginning. My favorite definition of product management is still Josh Elman's, which is to help your team and company ship the right product to your users. And the only modification I would make here is that when you're a product leader, it's, your team is the company, so it's help your company ship the right product to your users. And I went back through my calendar, my email, my notes, my journal, everything I'd done while taking this company on this journey. And I learned that 
all of the work I was doing was the right work. It wasn't that I was doing the wrong things. In fact, all of the work fell into what I thought of as being five key questions for a product leader to answer. Who's responsible for our vision? Is it right and is it going to work? Does everyone on the team know what we're trying to do? Are we retaining that team by giving them good career growth? And are we really performing at the peak that we could be performing at? And so the problem with this wasn't the five questions. I was doing the right stuff. The problem was every single day I was trying to solve 100% of these questions all of the time. There was no trade-off between them. It was just every day I'd be like, who should do it? What should do it? How do we do it? How are we going to keep these people? How are we going to make things go well? This is the thing that ends up feeling like everything is on fire all the time, because you're just constantly switching between these five different ideas. And so I think the thing I got from going through and learning about all of this is I really believe that you should answer the questions in roughly the right order. For the rest of the time, I'm going to share when I think you should answer them for optimal performance. And also, if you're kind of already at the place where it's on fire, how you can maybe mitigate that situation. And I also realized part of the problem was that I kept reopening them every day. It wasn't that anyone else necessarily expected me to. And so while those might be the five buckets, once you stop one, don't keep doing it over and over again. And so to go through that in a little bit more detail, stage one is the beginning of the company. And I think the most important thing here is deciding who sets the vision. And I know very many smart people in product have said this before. I was actually reading uh, on Marty Kagan's definition of what it means to be a head of product, that a lot of really talented people who take head of product jobs will say, oh, I'd love that job, but the CEO is visionary, and I really know that I want to be visionary too, and it's not going to work. Maybe some of you are those mature people. I have never once been that mature person. I went through two very painful experiences where I got to work for very visionary, very awesome founders. Except every day I was like, yeah, like I joined because they're really visionary and really great, but I still want to get to have a say too. I really like working on vision too. And so maybe it's not you, maybe it's someone on your team, but I think this is a thing that takes product people a really long time to learn. You don't necessarily have to be the person setting the vision, and you're setting yourself up for a lot of pain and a lot of organizational strife if you don't read the actual situation that's happening around you within the organization. And so I think if you can answer this question well, a lot of the other organizational things fall out of it. You don't necessarily have those conflicts later down the line where different executives are saying different things because you know who that decider is at the end of the day. And so at the beginning, until you get this question right, almost nothing else matters because you don't know where you're trying to get to. And I think this one is in particular is the one we try to reopen as product people. Uh, I used to try to reopen it every time I felt like I understood the space better, or I got a promotion, or I felt like I deserved it for some reason for some contribution to the company. Those aren't good reasons to reopen this conversation. It's a good time to reopen it if a new product leader arrives, if a CEO or founder or other visionary person at the company leaves, something in the company product strategy changes dramatically and makes that person no longer qualified, or the fourth one kind of goes with two and three, if for some reason the company trajectory changes. But other than that, there's not a good reason to keep debating who should be setting the vision for a company. It's just difficult for everyone. So then, once you get to this, I call it product, finding product market fit because early stage things, but you could also think of it in terms of deciding if the feature you're building is the right feature, for instance. And so when you get to this part, the question is really, is our vision right? And I think this is the part of vision that really matters for product leaders. You're the person in the organization who has a lot of say and a lot of ability to work across teams to find ways to validate things. And so I think at this point, ideally, you've completely shut down the who question. This is done. You can move entirely on to the what question. And of course, at this point, you have some degree of a team. So you have to tell them about what it is and how confident you are about that interval. And you want to keep the people around. But at the end of the day, telling people, here's the best spec template. Here's the best way to set strategy. Here's the best way to triage bugs. Honestly, even here's how to get promoted. Isn't that important if people aren't going to win? You don't stay at a company because your manager is nice if you don't actually believe the company is making something of value. And so this time around, I'm happy I've learned. Uh, my co-founder, Paul, 100% visionary. I've accepted me not very visionary. And so Paul's the visionary at our company. And this is great. It means we never have to talk about this ever again. Paul can sit there and be visionary. I take whatever vision he gives me, and I go figure out what to do with it. And so for me, that looks like a bunch of different things. Sometimes it's about market research. Is this a venture scalable business? Is this something that makes sense in our product portfolio? Sometimes it's user research. Does anyone need it? Will they like it? Sometimes it's what I think of as being B2B user research, but will anyone buy it? Sometimes it's, yeah, we'll just try building it and see what happens if it's something that's easy to build. And sometimes it's the competitive landscape like Dan was just talking about. Can we win in this space? Does this make sense? Does it differentiate us? And so I like using all of those techniques, but I think, again, we're excited about doing vision people. 
which means it's tempting to reopen, is our vision right, every single day? But you don't really need to open it up every single day. You need to open it up if something material changes. You learn something from one of those techniques, something dramatic changes in the market, or something dramatic changes about your technical abilities and assumptions. So that brings us to the third stage. This is the point at which you have decided who is setting the vision. You don't have to revisit that. You've decided pretty much what you're doing. Sure, you might look at it periodically, see if anything in the world has changed. But most of the time, all you need to do is communicate and keep everyone on one page. And I think this is particularly important at this stage because this is the stage at which you're hiring new people every single week. And what might seem obvious and like a key part of the company narrative and like a part of the mission that you've all been fulfilling together forever doesn't feel the same way to the person who joins as employee number 50. When Lola got to 50 people, for me, like I knew exactly what we were doing. I knew the entire story forever. I realized people who joined person 30, person 50 had a completely different perspective on the company than I did. And it's easy to lose sight of that if you aren't spending nearly all of your time making sure that people are moving the same way. And this, again, you're seeing the questions kind of shift as you get further along towards the right side of the chart. But this is when it starts being more important to keep those early employees happy. They've been there with you. They've helped find product market fit. You want to help them move forward with the company as it grows, assuming they're doing well. You want to help people perform. And you have more people, so it becomes more important to have good processes. And so when I think about this, the thing I learned best from Lolo over doing this is you can't just reinforce it one way. And it doesn't scale to go have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with every single person in the company every two weeks. That involves a lot of meetings. And so I looked at it and said, as a product leader, I can do this through the PM team. Is everyone on my team, do we talk about what we're doing every week? Do they go talk to their teams that they're working with about what they're doing? Does it happen through the exec team? I want every single exec to be telling their team, maybe not in the same language, the way you talk to salespeople might di be different than engineers, but the same fundamental concept. Through the founder, CEO, whichever visionary person you picked, that person is the heart of it. As much as you can go out as a product leader and say, logically, this is what we should do, people join for that person that they believe in, who they're just going to follow until the end of the world, and that person needs to be there and saying it over and over again. Through the other ways you communicate with people, through your emails, through stand-up meetings, through whatever it is that is the cadence of your office, and then also even just the office itself. People should be able to walk into your office and know what you're doing. And it isn't that your employees are going to learn what they're doing because it's on the wall. It's just a friendly reminder that happens over and over again. It's also important to make sure that it's getting through. And so instead of having one, all of those one-on-one -on -one meetings and relying on these other teams to communicate things, it was important to listen and kind of pick up on what people were saying and walk around and say, hey, what are you working on? Why are you working on it? And if I said why enough times, I wanted everyone to come back to the same fundamental answer. And the second part was finding some bellwethers, people who are really culturally central in the organization. I found that the longer I'd been in the leadership role, and the same thing for my manager, the more intimidating people would find having a conversation or saying, hey, no, I think that's wrong. And there were people in the organization they would still go talk to, and I made sure to maintain strong relationships with those people, so they would let me know if for some reason the vision was falling off the wagon, or that people didn't believe, or if people didn't quite understand why, so we could try to communicate it again. And so this one I don't think you actually have to revisit very often. Mostly when people seem confused or when you're getting different answers. Or the one that I actually think is scarier is when the entire team is pushing back against something. And I think at that point, it's really your responsibility as a product leader to go to the founder, the CEO, whoever it is who's made these decisions and say, hey, the entire team is pushing back. We need to work through this as an organization. Fourth, this is one I'm going to spend the least time on because I think there's a lot of really great content from people on this. But once you're scaling, you've got what you're doing down, you know who's doing it. You want to maintain the organization. And so at this point, your job becomes fundamentally about retaining great talent and giving everyone the resources they need. This is a lot of, when I worked at Kickstarter, what my boss, Brett Camper, did for the organization. We knew what we were executing on. The founder was very visionary. We knew the types of work we wanted to do. And so Brett was very focused on making sure each of us developed as product managers. And so just really briefly, one of the things I learned at Lola managing a bunch of new product managers that we moved over from other organizations, was I would always try to start people from a strength. I didn't want to put people in the deep end where they didn't know what was going on. I would take someone who's really empathetic, have them start on user research, expand out. Someone who's really detail-oriented, start in a quality role, expand out. I would figure out what that strength was, and then I would say, no matter what you do, my fault, not yours, you can't screw up, you can't get fired, do what you want. And then I would see how far they could get before they failed. And it built a lot of trust between me and those reports. They knew I was there for them, and I got a very good idea of what people are capable of. And then the last one I learned from our head of travel agents at Lola 
who said, when you're giving feedback to people about their career, you're giving them a choice. Tell them the behavior that you're observing and tell them how that behavior will limit them. Don't necessarily tell them they can't do it or that they have to change. And that really dramatically changed how my team worked and grew together. Providing tools. Uh, I really like the McDonald's theory of lunch from John Bell, which is this idea of people are standing around saying, I don't know where to go to lunch, just say McDonald's, and someone will find you a better answer. I feel the same way about most product process. If someone's like, what product should we use? I'm like, Trello. And then I wait for people to argue, and if someone has a better answer, I actually like Trello. But if someone has a strong reason to use something besides that, like, fine, okay. <laughs> but I got us having the conversation. And then also, don't feel like you have to do it all yourself. Find some external mentors. Not everyone has to learn directly from you. Google Ventures was great for this. They had a user research mentor um, who worked really closely with the user researcher that I'd hired and helped her develop because that wasn't my formal background. And so you don't have to revisit this very often when you get new team members, when you get feedback, maybe during annual reviews. And so diagnosing this for yourself. If you're feeling like this right now, totally fine. Every one of my friends who I've talked to has at some point felt like this. Think about the five questions in order. Who's responsible? Is it right? Does everyone understand? Are we retaining our team? Do we have peak performance? If that doesn't really resonate, maybe think about what organization looks like yours right now and pattern match to that and start trying to answer those questions. And if neither of those work, think about what your personal struggle is. For each of these questions, there are ways that you can fail as a product leader that aren't necessarily about the process. So it could be, are you willing to let go of the vision? Are you only evaluating the vision in the way that you like, mine being user research? Are you only communicating the way you like, mine being long emails? Uh, do you respect your team? I've talked to a lot of managers who are like, I hate these millennials, I don't know what they're doing. And are you focusing on style instead of substance? So are you thinking about how you would run that meeting, or are you thinking about how that meeting needs to be run for your report to do well? So if you take one thing away from this, you don't have to use this exact framework at all, but I want you to understand that the important thing is you can't solve all five questions at once, no matter how many productivity hacks you find. And the important part of balance is deciding what question you need to answer right now and really focusing on that. Thanks. <laughs>